I'm going to I'm going to turn things over now to Jay Laboff, who's our on our uh, organizing committee for Club of Med, and uh, he'll introduce Cynthia. Go ahead, Jay. Thanks, Charlie. It's my real pleasure to introduce to you today um, Cynthia Bell, who is a distinguished university professor and Sarah Idell Pyle Professor of Anthropology. She's also the co-director for the Center of Research on Tibet at Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Cynthia is a physical anthropologist whose research focuses on human adaptation to high altitude hypoxia. She's worked among all the indigenous high altitude populations ranging from the East African to the Central Asian and Andean plateaus and has found a variety of pattern of adaptation to the same stress of high altitude of hypoxia. Her work focuses on the genetics of adaptive traits and evidence for natural selection with the role of nitric oxide in oxygen delivery at high altitude and with the human ecology of high altitude in Tibetan nomads. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Bell is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences, a member of the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She also serves on the board of directors for the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has served on several boards and committees at the National Academies. I've known Cynthia, which is why I was so excited to introduce her since she served as the chair of an organizing committee for a National Academy's convocation that I organized in 2012 on thinking evolutionarily, evolution education across the biology curriculum. So you can see she has many, many different interests. And so I will leave it there. And Cynthia, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Well, I thank Jay for that uh, introduction and Meredith and Charlie for organizing this uh, fun series. Uh, I'm going to talk about hemoglobin and high altitude hypoxia, uh, the evolution of adaptations and the implications for public health. And in case you want to contact me uh, after, uh, hear my email. So my plan is to talk about what is high altitude hypoxia, uh, to talk about population differences in hematological responses to that stress, then talk about the, briefly about the pathology of anemia and then uh, make the point that both uh, normal responses to high altitude hypoxia and to anemia evolved, uh, involved the same oxygen homeostasis pathways. And then I'll talk about the implications for evaluating population health. First, let's consider what is the stress of high altitude hypoxia. It's a great stress from uh, the standpoint of the investigator because it's a severe stress, it's unavoidable. Everyone at a given altitude is exposed to the same stress. So to describe what the stress is, uh, this plot has altitude in meters along the x-axis and the percent of sea level inspired oxygen on the y. So if we think of me in Cleveland or some of you in Raleigh-Durham, think of a breath of, ox of air having, let's just call it baseline, 100% of the oxygen molecules. We travel to Santa Fe at 2,200 meters, and we're down to the same breath of air having about 75% of the, those oxygen molecules. We continue our trip out west to Pikes Peak, 4,400 meters, and our same breath of air has just 60% of the oxygen molecules. Now that is a stress because we have requirements, absolute requirements for steady delivery of oxygen to our metabolizing tissues. And our body has many evolved genetic, molecular, and physiological responses. Looking at low altitude natives like uh, me, and probably most of us here uh, today, uh, people who were born and raised 
let's say below a uh, thousand meters, uh, when we go to altitude, within days, we respond by making more hemoglobin, the molecule that carries oxygen, and closed in more red blood cells. So this plot summarizes the results of a number of studies of lowlanders whose hemoglobin concentrations were measured before they went to altitude. Each one of these symbols represents the average hemoglobin of a sample before it was acutely exposed to altitude. Then people were taken to a range of altitudes from 3,100 meters up to 5,000 meters. And you can see that everyone's hemoglobin increased. And some markedly, here's someone or one group of people who went from about 14 and a half to about 17 grams per DL. Another one from around 15 and a half to around 18 and a half. So for the longest time, basically since the 1890s, we thought this was the response. This is the human response. And that interpretation was reinforced by studies of Andean Highlanders. So this plot is organized a little bit differently. And these two parallel lines represent the normal range of hemoglobin for adult men at low altitude in the US. These two brown dots represent the average hemoglobin concentration for men in the US Europeans, so that means they're essentially low altitude natives, even though they're living in Denver, still have their hemoglobins within the normal range, or in Leadville, Colorado, where at about 3,000 meters or 10,000 feet, their hemoglobins are well above the normal range. So that's consistent. That tells us that short-term exposure over the course of days, uh, for lowlanders leads to an increase in hemoglobin. These two brown dots uh, tell us that uh, life, living for years at altitude, uh, re results in an increase in hemoglobin. And then these Andean Highlanders. Now Andean Highlanders have lived at altitude in the Andes for probably uh, permanently for about 10,000 years. So there's been plenty of time for evolution and adaptation to occur. However, what we see is that the higher the altitude, the higher the hemoglobin. So this further supported the idea that this is what people do at altitude. This is the hemoglobin response. That was until we started asking a very simple question, which is, do all indigenous high altitude populations respond the same way to that stress? Now, this so far, and including this slide, uh, these are all I'm focusing on studies where one set of investigators uh, studied, collected the data. And that is to cut down on noise from different measuring devices and different inclusion criteria. So here we've got a solid blue line showing the increase in hemoglobin with altitude among Andean Highlanders. And then we've got some individual green dots that represents uh, samples that I obtained. Again, these are adult men at different altitudes in, uh, among Tibetans, both in Tibet and in Nepal. And you can see that, whoa, look at this. We've got kind of no increase as high as 4,000, a little bit over 4,000 meters. Uh, when stressed enough, Tibetans do increase their hemoglobin concentration. Yet, even when they're stressed and have increased hemoglobin concentration, they're much lower than Andean Highlanders. Now we can look at a much noisier plot that's probably much more realistic, comparing a number of populations. Um, Andean Highlanders, again, these dots represent the average 
of Andean Highlanders who were uh, long-term residents at low altitude, down here with 1,000 meters and below. They're well within the normal sea level range. And even before getting to 3,000 meters, almost all the Andean Highlanders have elevated hemoglobin, average hemoglobin concentrations compared to the U.S. low altitude norm or normal range of variation. In contrast, and also note that at any one altitude, there's a lot of variation within Andean Highlanders, whether they're at high or at low. It tells you, well, we're, for sure some of it is confounding factors, other uh, noise from measurement, noise from a number of sources. In contrast, look at the Tibetans. Again, we have a wide range of variation, yet about half of the Tibetans, or maybe a little bit more, have average hemoglobin concentrations within the normal sea level range. And on average, they are, have lower average hemoglobin concentration than Andean Highlanders. In fact, the average corrected for altitude for the samples above 3,000 meters is that Andean Highlanders have 1.8 grams per DL uh, higher hemoglobin concentration than Tibetans. It's almost 10% higher. Now also note, there are a couple of other samples represented by very few symbols. Take a look at this one gray dot around 3,900 meters, another one around 3,500 meters. Those are East Africans. They are Amhara from Ethiopia. And um, someone has been living at high altitude in Ethiopia for um, 10 or 20,000 years. Uh, the archaeological evidence isn't really solid. But again, we're inferring that there's been enough time for selection to have acted. So for Amhara, look a lot, quote, look, uh, their average hemoglobins look a lot more like Tibetans than, uh, than they do Andean Highlanders. Here, down at 1,100 meters, is a low altitude Amhara sample. Also note that there's not very much evidence. Similarly, for another closely related, very closely related ethnic group in Ethiopia, the Oromo, who are only represented by a single point, that's because there, as far as I know, there haven't been any other studies, and they show a marked elevation above the sea level range of variation. Aromo are interesting because they, we have historical evidence to indicate they've only been at high altitude for about 500 years. So they are much more like Europeans at high altitude or Chinese at high altitude than they are Andean or Tibetan or Amhara Highlanders. Turning to anemia, now remember that the people that I just finished talking about are all healthy. Turning to anemia, anemia is a pathology. It's a pathology of too few red blood cells or too little hemoglobin to meet physiologic needs for oxygen. So um, we've got a, two cartoons here, normal blood. You can see a certain concentration of uh, hemoglobin in all of those red blood cells. Here's an anemic person on the right, fewer red blood cells and therefore uh, fewer uh, hemoglobin molecules to carry oxygen. Oops. Roughly a quarter of the world's population suffers from iron deficiency anemia. So it's a small proportion of the world's population, maybe 5% lives at altitude and is exposed to uh, high altitude hypoxia, but a quarter suffer from iron deficiency anemia. And as this figure shows, um, 
both situations result in stressing the oxygen delivery system, although for different reasons. Uh, in the case of iron deficiency anemia, we have fewer red blood cells. There's less hemoglobin because of fewer of these green oxygen molecules. In the case of high altitude, iron is fine as long as you're studying iron sufficient people, but what you're missing are these white uh, oxygen molecules. The response to anemia and the response to high altitude hypoxia use the same molecular pathway. And here's a cartoon of that molecular pathway uh, and the genes involved, and some of the genes involved. Our cells all have uh, pro oxygen sensing proteins and they're encoded by a locus called Eglin-1. We have transcription factors called hypoxia inducible factors one, two, and three. I'm going to focus on hypoxia-inducible factor two. And uh, they are proteins, they're composed of two subunits, and for hypoxia-inducible factor two, the variable subunit is uh, encoded by a protein called EPAS, uh, sorry, a gene called EPAS1. When the cell senses uh, hypoxia, EPAS1 accumulates, more hypoxia, uh, HIF2 accumulates, and because it's a transcription factor, it induces the transcription of hundreds of genes. So right away, you can appreciate this can be complicated. But those genes include genes intimately involved in the production of red blood cells and the production of hemoglobin. Erythropoietin inducing uh, the formation of the precursors of red blood cells. Hepcidin allowing uh, iron to be, uh, more iron to be absorbed from the gut at, for synthesizing hemoglobin. So like any pathway, it intersects with other pathways and particularly the iron homeostasis pathway. Tibetans are the group for which we have the best genetic evidence of their uh, genetic adaptation to high altitude hypoxia. Tibetans have unique variants in Eglin-1 and in EPAS-1 and they have uniquely high frequencies of those Eglin-1 variants and those EPAS-1 variants and uniquely high frequencies of genetic variants at some of the target genes for HIF-2. And some of those target genes are involved in synthesizing uh, hemoglobin. So, all right, that sounds nice. That sounds like we're getting towards uh, evidence for genetic adaptation. I should also say that Eglin-1 and HIF and uh, EPAS-1 also show very strong signals of selection among Tibetans. And EPAS-1 associates with hemoglobin concentration among Tibetans. And this has been replicated. I make a point of this replication because so frequently either the results of a candidate gene analysis or the results of a genome-wide association analysis do not replicate, but this association does. Again, each pair of samples here, actually subsamples, represents a replication represents the average of a sample of Tibetans at a given altitude who are homozygous for the Tibetan variant of EPAS-1. They're over here on the left. On the right is people from that same sample living at the same altitude who are homozygous for the alternate, the ancestral EPAS-1 allele. And the 
people who are homozygous for the Tibetan version of EPAS1 have lower hemoglobin concentrations by a half to as, many, as much as three grams per DL of hemoglobin. Now the genetics for the East African and Andean samples are much less clear. And none of them have been replicated. Uh, in East Africa, the Amhara, this population that we have pretty sure has been at altitude for thousands of years, uh, one study found a single SNP associating with low uh, hemoglobin concentration. Another study reported four different loci that were not found in the previously mentioned study. So it's not clear what's going on uh, with Amhara that leads, well, at least genetically, that leads to them having lower hemoglobin concentrations than the Oromo, closely related, but who respond as if they have not been subject to natural selection for uh, lower hemoglobin concentration. And there's been just a single study of the Oromo. For Andean samples, the situation is complicated. There are a variety of studies, some finding uh, that Eglin-1 associates with hemoglobin concentration. Well, I shouldn't say some, one associate finding that association, and another couple finding an association with EPAS-1, and other studies finding no associations at all. So it's really not clear uh, the extent to which natural selection worked on uh, hemoglobin concentration in these other samples. So now let's move back to looking at uh, anemia. And the World Health Organization has published a, a series of handbooks on how to diagnose anemia. Here is uh, the front page of one of them. And one of the things that uh, this, this set of instructions relies on is that low, efficient, uh, low hemoglobin concentration reflects iron deficiency. Uh, the WHO established thresholds, uh, cutoffs of hemoglobin concentration uh, for diagnosing anemia. And note that you have to adjust uh, based on age and sex. So babies, children, young adults, older adults, males and females will have different thresholds. It also adds adjustments for some ethnicities and for smoking and for altitude. The WHO criteria were based on a 1970s study of Andean men in Peru and who show an increase in hemoglobin concentration with altitude. And therefore the adjustments recommended by the WHO are based on Andean Highlanders and those Andean men. So let's see what happens when we apply those adjustments based on Andean men to our own samples of Andean men and Tibetan men. Now these are data that I collected. These are samples of men. There are more than 100 men in each group. They live at the same altitude of 4,000 meters. They are iron sufficient and they are not suffering from uh, infectious disease. Using the low altitude cutoff for anemia, which is shown in the vertical black line, none of the Andean men and 5% of the Tibetan men would be classified by the WHO as having anemia. Now let's apply the WHO altitude adjustment. Well, more, and those are, the cutoff is represented by the vertical uh, dashed line this time. Andean men um, now exhibit 13% iron deficiency anemia. Remember, they're all iron sufficient. And Tibetans move up to a whopping 79% of uh, people who 
by using those altitude adjustments would be classified as iron deficient and anemic. Now in the Andes, in Peru actually, physicians there tell me that by law, they are required to apply the altitude adjustments and to treat everyone who falls below the WHO cutoff. In Tibet and in Nepal, people tell me they pay no attention. What about Ethiopian Highlanders? Remember, there were two groups, Amhara, the one that did not increase hemoglobin concentration at altitude, and Aromo, the sample that did. Here on the left, we've got men, and we have applied the altitude correction, and we see that 9% of the Aromo at altitude would be classified as anemic. 28% of the men, the Amhara men. Similarly, for the Oromo, just 14% of women would be classified as anemic using the WHO threshold, and a whopping 49% of the Ethiopian women. Interestingly, there is some evidence that elevated hemoglobin concentrations associate with poorer function. For example, among Tibetan men, uh, looking at exercise capacity, how much physical work can people do? The higher the hemoglobin above normal sea level values, the poorer the exercise capacity implying poorer oxygen delivery. Among Tibetan women, higher hemoglobin concentration above their average is associated with poorer pregnancy outcome. That is fewer uh, pregnancies become live births. Interestingly, among Andean women, it is also the case that higher hemoglobin concentrations associate with poor pregnancy outcomes. This is a little unexpected here because uh, the Andean Highlanders have elevated levels. That leaves us with a really big question. Taking these evolutionary differences into account, how can we fairly determine the appropriate hemoglobin concentration cutoff at high altitude? So oh, that is a big to-do item. And actually the WHO is in the process of, uh, it's about in the middle of a five-year project to reevaluate the ways in which it establishes criteria for determining iron deficiency anemia and its severity you can appreciate the convenience of a single easy to obtain measure like hemoglobin. And you can appreciate they might want to continue using that. Um, we also know now a lot more about hemoglobin and the factors influencing it. And it will be very interesting to see how the WHO uh, takes into account these population differences in hemoglobin response to high altitude. So with that, I'll say thank you and entertain questions. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> thanks very much. Thanks very much, Cynthia. I know we have some questions that have popped up in the chat box. Uh, to get things started though, does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask out loud of the whole group or of Cynthia in particular? Uh, looks like we have one hand up. Uh, Lou, would you like to ask your question? Oh, you're muted, Lou. Unmuted now, I hope. Yep. Hi. Gotcha. I, you know, that was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm a recent uh, transposition to North Carolina from Cincinnati, so you're not too far. Uh, 
away from where I, where I was. Um, one question I have is they think about developing these guidelines. Is the WHO or other organizations thinking about putting it in the context of genotype and the factors that we know, you know, seem to associate with the relative levels? It seems the numbers would be big enough to think about doing that. Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. I, I know a few of the people involved and genotyping has not come into it. They really are still, as far as I know, focusing on a biological indicator. Well, what, what's the word I want? Phenotypic indicators. I'm guessing that, you know, just, well, I think there are two reasons for that. One is that despite the fact that I showed those nice replications of the association between EPAS-1 and hemoglobin concentration among Tibetans, uh, EPAS-1 accounts for at most 5% of the variance. No, but that's still pretty good. And you could develop a polygenic risk score, you know, for, you know, hemoglobin level, essentially predicting using multiple loci, you know, where it might fall. Yeah, we, we've done that for Tibetans with modest success, but maybe we just need more people. Ha, famous, that now I'm talking like a geneticist, right? <laughs> But I like the idea, we, it would have to be really simple, right? Something that could be done on the spot inexpensively. Great, thank you for that. Uh, so I received a question via email from Kaizhong Yi. Uh, Kaizhong asks, given that hemoglobin responds to altitude differently in different populations, it doesn't seem to be a good universal indicator for anemia. Um, I know you mentioned uh, that the World Health Organization is working on setting different a different threshold or an appropriate threshold, but uh, Kaizhong's wondering, uh, is there a better indicator for anemia than hemoglobin? Um, the, the people who, uh, some people whom I respect a lot suggest a panel, uh, a, a simple panel uh, that would, uh, you could have your hemoglobin and then uh, in this panel, you'd, you'd need some blood to do this, but it can be done in a very small amount of uh, blood could, with a finger stick. And you would have one measure of inflammation, which is important because inflammation causes iron withholding and could be one explanation for low hemoglobin. And then there are a couple of measures of iron metabolism. One is a protein that uh, hepcidin that I already mentioned that influences the uptake of iron from the gut and the other is a protein that's involved in iron transport. So it would be simpler, it would still, and that would be closer to um, applicable everywhere. Great, thank you. Uh, next, we have a question from James Yu. James, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, Hi Cynthia. It's good to see you. <laughs> good to see um, you. Yeah, I had a question that may have gotten answered by Diana, so thank you, Diana. Um, but it was, what's the original evolutionary reason or purpose for increasing hemoglobin in response to hypoxia at high altitude? Because I kind of see this um, increase in hemoglobin as an evolutionary mismatch where Andeans and CERN Oromo, um, they have this higher amounts of hemoglobin, but it's actually maladaptive at these extreme high altitudes as you, for the reasons you described earlier where lower exercise capacity and poor health, um, health outcomes and pregnancy outcomes. Yeah, uh, the thinking is that we, that the oxygen homeostasis pathway did evolve at in organisms at low altitude. We first see evidence, it's, it's a, a system that is found in all multicellular organisms. And the particular uh, hypoxia inducible factor that I was focusing on, EPAS-1, is found in all mammals. And the hypothesis is that basically since all of our cells require oxygen, all of our cells need to have a hair trigger 
very fast response to fluctuations in that. And as you said, uh, you, that once we stress ourselves by going to altitude and just that hair trigger response doesn't restore uh, oxygen homeostasis, it stays on unless there's, so, apparently, unless there's selection to turn it off. So I, I, the logic of mismatch is, seems reasonable because the stress is different. I see, thank you. Yep. Great, hey, thank you. Uh, next, it looks like we have a question from Charlie Nunn. <laughs> okay. Um, Cynthia, that was a great talk. Thanks very much. I wonder if you could tell us anything, uh, give us some more details on the Denisovans and their role in some of these genetic variants and what the latest findings are in terms of that. And uh, perhaps related to some of the other questions, do you think that they, these uh, genetic variants were favored in Denisovans originally for high altitude or perhaps for some other, some other adaptive purpose? Yeah, for uh, who are the Denis Denisovans is the, is the first uh, question I should answer. And that is the Denisovans uh, date is a population that was first it's the first species, or maybe not species, but major human population, identified on the basis of its DNA. And it was first known uh, from the DNA of one little finger bone of a little girl who lived about 50,000 years ago in Siberia, what is now Siberia. And we now have a second Denisovan genome and a couple of teeth. Uh, and uh, there is evidence that the ECAS-1 variant that Tibetans have is the ECAS-1 variant that the Denisovans had. Now, the Denisovans lived at low altitude in Siberia, you know, hundreds of miles away from the Tibetan plateau. So what is ECAS-1 from the Denisovans present 50,000 years ago doing among Tibetans who have been at altitude you know, permanently at any rate for something like 10,000 years. The, the, we also see Denisovan DNA in scattered modern populations across Southeast Asia. Um, not very much of it, the highest proportion is found in among Melanesians, and by highest proportion, I mean two to three percent uh, of uh, Melanesian DNA is uh, seems to be uh, from the Denisovans. So my hypothesis is, and I've checked this with a few others, like Svante Pabo, uh, that there was a widespread low altitude East Asian population a long time ago. And that the people who went to altitude by chance carried the EPAS-1 genotype that we see among Tibetans now. So we don't think that, uh, we don't know what, you know, apart from a hypoxia-inducible factor, we don't know what it was doing, if it was doing anything special among the Denisovans. Uh, it wasn't until people went to altitude that it was subject to selection. And I, also, I should point out also that we don't know the exact SNP that, is associ that associates with hemoglobin. And the linkage disequilibrium is so strong and so wide in EFAS1 that uh, we can't isolate you know, we can get it down to a, an area of about 100 That's it. If there's any molecular biologist who's here who wants to slice and dice uh, e pass one uh, SNPs, that would be really fun to see the result. Thanks, Cynthia. The future project for someone. Uh, so we had a 
Great question from Jay in the chat. Uh, Jay asks, what do we know about other adaptations of the circulatory system to hypoxia, especially in people who increase hemoglobin and red blood cells? I would think that such a large increase of hemoglobin and red blood cells can make the blood more viscous and place stress on the system by making blood harder to pump, etc. Are there corresponding compensations in the heart, vessels, and capillaries of Andean people living at very high altitudes? Yes. <laughs> and that, and um, first I could, well, yes, they, um, the blood is very thick among Andean Highlanders. Uh, uh, just to give you a qualitative measure, uh, when I take a venipuncture uh, in, a, uh, and I'm at high altitude in the Andes, you know, like you would have done when you go to have your annual physical, the blood doesn't spurt. The blood oozes <laughs> into the vacutator. So definitely thick. And uh, one of the things that uh, results is that people have hyper hypertrophy of their right ventricle because their right ventricle is pushing against this uh, thick blood. Um, and, and we do not see that uh, hypertrophy among Tibetans with the lower hemoglobin concentration. And we also do see, to uh, get to your point about measurements of blood flow, we see that uh, Tibetans tend to have higher blood flow in their brains and in their lungs and in their periphery than Andean Highlanders. So we think that Tibetans are focused, and Amhara from East Africa, are uh, delivering oxygen by uh, focusing on faster blood flow rather than more hemoglobin. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, we have a question from Marcy Uyinoyama. Marcy, you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, okay, so um, uh, thanks very much. I've been uh, following your work actually for many years now and uh, I just had a question about the evolutionary mechanism that you have in mind. Uh, so you mentioned that the Amhara have been living at high altitude for some unknown amount of time, but in any case, uh, probably enough to allow evolutionary change. And uh, so like, if we say that a generation is 20 years, uh, you know, some thousands of years is some hundreds of generations. So I just like to know what kind of genetic mechanism you have in mind and the intensity of selection that would, um, that, that would explain the physiological differences. Yeah, those are good questions. Uh, the evidence we have for Amhara is at least 5,000 years. So that's a couple hundred generations. Uh, and at least hypothetically, there's been enough opportunity for selection. Uh, you're asking a good question about what the mechanism might be. We, uh, it doesn't seem as though it's a single major gene. So I think the uh, earlier question about polygenic adaptation is something that we should probably go back and look at in our uh, Ethiopian samples because that um, may uh, that may be the key. It also is the key. Uh, I hate to say this in public, but uh, we measure hemoglobin concentration because we've been measuring it since the 1890s and because it goes up with altitude and because it's involved with oxygen transport and with a lot of reasons for measuring hemoglobin. But it is entirely possible that hemoglobin is a marker for some other biological trait that we have not yet measured. And uh, so what uh, I and a number of others are trying to do now 
is look at more traits, not just focus on hemoglobin. Uh, find more HIF target genes and their proteins and look at them. So that's a, a, uh, a tentative answer to your question. So do you think that um, there are many uh, polygenes that affect like a largely plastic response and if they all have a relatively modest change that you can get a big physiological change under the right yeah. conditions? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. So we probably have time for one or two more questions. Uh, next up, we have a question from Thomas Strusacker. Thomas, you can go ahead with your question. Yes, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, um, I wonder what, what's known about um, high altitude adaptations in non-human primates. I'm thinking oh. in particular of some of those species that live both at almost at sea level and then get up to mm -hmm. oh, between 10 and 14,000 feet. Uh, some of the macaques in uh, Asia, uh, Hamadryas baboons, and then of course the high altitude famous ones, the so-called gelada baboons. They don't get down to sea level, but they do get pretty low. Uh, quite a yeah. range there. Yeah. Actually, I passed through uh, the place where the uh, high altitude baboons are when I'm on my way to my Ethiopian field site. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because we don't have evidence from wild populations. I'm pretty sure that one of Jacinta Beer, Beener's students is trying to collect that from the high altitude uh, baboons. So that'll be interesting to see. The evidence that we have comes from zoo animals in the US who live between sea level and about 2000 meters. And they've been compared with human populations living across the same range. And it's very interesting that uh, none of the primates show an increase in hemoglobin concentration with altitude. Right, and red blood cells, nothing there, I guess, no. No. A long uh, time ago, somebody was suggesting that there were other, <clears throat> other things going on in the blood, nothing to directly do it with uh, hemoglobin, and I can't remember what it is, but... Um, you... Yeah, yes, there are, uh, for example, in uh, mice and in some birds, there, uh, there's actually a change in the biochemistry of the hemoglobin itself, so that it's a uh, higher affinity hemoglobin. Just like we have high affinity fetal hemoglobin when we're in utero, and then we, now we're making as adults, adult hemoglobin, um, some species uh, adapt that way. Right. And, and the beautiful climbs along altitude gradients of the alleles associated with that form of hemoglobin. Right, but you don't see anything like that in humans? No. Ah, okay, thank you, appreciate it. Great. So I think we have time for one final question. Looks like we have a raised hand from Joseph Graves. Joe, you can go ahead with your question. And I'm actually even unmuted this time. Hi, Joe. So, so we, so Charlie and. Oh, you're being and, combative. Oh no, no, I'm <laughs> never combative. I'm looking at your virtual background. <laughs> oh, oh you mean, that's just Ali. I mean, he's the great. I know. Shepherd. So, so anyway, Ted. Uh, Garland and, and Charlie Nunn and I were, were chatting back and forth about doing experimental evolution on mice at low oxygen pressure. That actually might be a, a way to get a handle on this, but then, but then Ted said, you know, the difficulty of trying to maintain those cultures um, under low oxygen would be prohibitive, and, and I tend to agree with him. So, I was thinking the, the better way to do this would be with looking at insects, do fruit flies. Mm. Okay. That, had, that has been done by Gabby Haddad at UCSD. The thing that he did though was, and, and he has bred, he uh, exposed fruit flies to extremely, I mean, it's, what, it's something like 1% oxygen. Mm. 
over the course of uh, dozens of generations. And he uh, found selection, but not in EPAS1 and Eglin1. He found selection in uh, some target genes that have not been implicated in humans. Yeah, well, but, I wouldn't necessarily expect, you know, that you would get the same set of genes between yeah. arthropods and humans. But would, what would be interesting, though, is being able to determine the level of selection pressure, which is one of the questions that we were talking about. Um, yeah. The yeah. closest evidence, well, the closest evidence that I have is that among Tibetan women living uh, at high altitudes in Nepal, that a one standard deviation increase in hemoglobin concentration leads to about 2% lower uh, chances that a pregnancy will become a live birth, which is not a big selection coefficient, but if it worked over generations, it could have a big change. Yeah, certainly. Anyway, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, thank you, Cynthia, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, this is really stimulating, very interesting. Thanks so much for taking the time to do this today. Thank you. Oh. And I want to thank Jay for uh, doing the introduction and Meredith, of course, for organizing everything, keeping us running on time. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, before I let everyone go, uh, I just wanted to call your attention to a couple of things. First of all, we're going to take a three-week break. Uh, since we're sort of in the thick of summer, and it's a short summer for a lot of us this year, we're going to take a three-week break, and we start up again uh, in August with Brandon Abunu, who's going to be presenting uh, to us, and I think it's about August 10th or no, August uh, 17th or so. Then we have Amy Body and some of her colleagues who are going to present uh, related to some paper, a paper that they recently published in Evolution Medicine and Public Health. Then we have Lou Muglia and some of his colleagues who will be talking about a paper they have out in Nature Communications, which I think is going to be fascinating. And we also have Dan Lieberman on, online or uh, in, the, in the queue, uh, who's going to be talking about uh, his new book that's coming out on exercise. And so it'll be a little bit of a book, a book club for Club of Med, as we've had in the past. And the final thing I want to share with everyone, I'm going to share my screen really quickly here. Um, is this call we have for student and postdoc presenters. If you go to the Club of Med website, as you can see here, uh, you can go down and find the link uh, to nominate someone else or to volunteer uh, to put in an application to give a short talk. Uh, these would be 12-minute talks. Uh, we're hoping for, um, you know, sort of finishing PhD students and early postdocs uh, to give them a chance to share their results, especially um, you know, at this time when so many conferences have been canceled. So please check this out, click on that form and nominate people, or if you are a student or a postdoc and you would like to have this opportunity to share your findings with the audience of Club Ev Med, uh, fill out the form for yourself. We're gonna allow 12 minute talks with a little bit of time for conversation, and then we're gonna have some breakout rooms so that people can really have some interactions with each of those individual students and postdocs. So please take advantage of that. Okay, with that, um, I think we'll close up. Uh, am I missing anything, Meredith? Did I cover everything? Nope, that's all. Okay, thank you all for joining. This is a great conversation. Uh, take a three-week break from Club Med, and please join us in early August, in mid-August. Thanks. <laughs>